<laughs> Tonight, the Lord willing, will complete the 25th chapter of Genesis. This will be our 40th lesson. <coughs> Jacob, Esau, and the birthright. It's a uh, familiar incident in Scripture, but then that sometimes is what makes it difficult to deal with it. We'll be reading verses 28 through 34. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. <clears throat> now the entire lives of uh, Jacob and Esau following their birth and under this event is summed up in these words. The boys grew. <laughs> Esau was a cunning hunter, and Jacob was a plain man. It's quite a summation, isn't it? There's no record, no record of any childhood experiences like there was with Ishmael and Isaac. And now we'll find that they differed in who they preferred. <laughs> Jacob loved and preferred Esau, and Rebekah loved and preferred Jacob. And the Spirit then reveals a single event that on the surface didn't look like all that important of an event. Be a single event in which the inheritance passes from Esau to Jacob. Now, this is not the way men would deliver the records of Jacob and Esau. Let's be clear about this. This is not how men would deliver it. But the Lord's revelations are details of his purpose, not of the people involved. His records accent what he's doing. Yeah. Amen. And if it looks like men's doing it, God's doing it through them. We must not allow ourselves to be diverted to a carnal assessment of this event. And believe me, a lot of people have been. Now this report will shed some light <coughs> on how God will bring the Messiah into the world, fulfilling his promise to Abraham. Because the circumstances at this point don't match the promise. God will not build around what men do. Amen. Now this, I'm going to go over this quite a bit because this, this is not generally known. God, I'm going to reaffirm it. God will not build around what men do or have done. Yeah. He will not. Mm -hmm. You may find instances where you think that he does, but I'm going to show you some tonight that no, this isn't the case at all. God does not build his purpose around what men do or have done. 
He shapes it around his will. Yeah, that's right. And this is a doctrinal proclamation. Mm -hmm. He works all things after the counsel of his will. Mm -hmm. yeah. It originates with him, not with men. Yes. It's God who's working in the earth, working salvation in the midst of the earth. It's, it's not man who's working, it's God who's working. Mm -hmm. As we expose our minds to this event, we must not allow human reasoning to clutter our thinking. Even though this passage is in the Word of God and a divine summation is given, men still have tampered with this text. Even though God told people through Moses and through Jesus and through John, don't add to my word. Don't mix your thoughts in there with it. See, but men insist on doing this. They still do this. It's quite common. They have their reasons they present, but they, we won't listen to their reasons. Owing to this passage, some people have said things about Jacob that God didn't say. Yeah, that's right. I want to be dogmatic about this. Because it's serious business to attribute something to someone God didn't attribute to them. Yeah. You don't want to be judged that way, do you? No. You don't want to be judged by what other people have said about you, do you? No. And yet there are people that judge Jacob by what other people said about him. Yeah. Yeah. He said what God said about him. So we're going to approach this text with, uh, with caution. Now I'm going to confine myself to what's revealed in this text. I'm not going to do any speculating. <laughs> if God doesn't speak against someone, I'm not going to speak against him. And if he does, I am. That's, that's the way it's going to be. Now let's establish first of all that God is always, through history, dealt with men within the scope of the knowledge available to them. It's an important thing to know. Because some people judge these past saints as though they knew what we know. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's always done this. Let's, take, let's start with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, they heard the word of God made quite clear the parameters that they had to live within. The Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest of it thou shalt die. Now, he didn't judge Adam and Eve about the way they cultivated the garden or the manner in which they picked the fruit, whether they eat it raw or whether they eat it cooked. He judged them in accordance with their level of knowledge. He gave them one thing, one prohibition, and that's the context in which he judged their wrong. Their wrong was defined by that one prohibition. That's right. As far as they're concerned, that was the only sin they knew about. That was it. Now he dealt with Cain the same way. He dealt with him within what a scope of what he knew, what he understood. So God told him, he said, Now if you do well, thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So he made the message clear to Cain. Let's be clear about this. Yeah. If you do what's right, you'll be accepted. Yeah. That's right. Amen. If you don't, sin's a lion at the door. Right. So he made it clear, and he dealt with Cain on the basis of that, mm -hmm. that revelation. The whole world of Noah's day, he dealt with it according to what they knew. Mm -hmm. They'd heard from the mouth of Enoch yes. about the time God was going to judge those with ungodly deeds and ungodly speeches that they ungodly uttered. Yeah. He, so they had this word from Enoch, Amen. and Noah for 500 years was a preacher of righteousness. They'd heard about it. They'd heard. They'd heard. And they had the testimony of nature, so they didn't know a lot, but they knew enough no. not to go seek in their own way, and they were judged within the context of what they knew. So yes? This leaves, no, this, leaves, this leaves no excuse for men today drawing conclusions without seeing the truth for it's it's there in black and white it's there for them to see that's right i mean it's it's all it's all over the world we live in so great a light that there is no excuse for men having deficient knowledge that's right <coughs> we're going to build on this quite a bit 
And I'm going to make this affirmation that if God's made something known in Timbuktu, yeah. no matter where a person in the world lives, is his obligation to find out what was known in Timbuktu. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's the way God operates. They're to seek the Lord, if happily they might find him. Feel after him. See, that means going wherever there's any kind of Amen. knowledge at all. The builders of Shinar, they've been a clear witness that God protected people. You got Noah and his family. Did they pass this along? This was known by the whole human race. That God had saved a family and protected a family and these people at Shinar forgot about that and sought to build a name for themselves yes. and to make their own protection. So they were judged in view of what they, what they knew. Abraham and all of God's dealings with Abraham from the beginning when he called him Till he died, God always dealt with him according to what he'd made known to him. He didn't knock him down for mentioning Eliezer. That's right. He didn't upbraid him mm -hmm. for having Ishmael, mm -hmm. but because he didn't know. Yeah. He was just operating within a limited scope of knowledge, and God dealt with Abraham according to what Abraham knew. Yeah. Amen. I know it sounds simple, but <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah. They had a man who was righteous set at their gate that was vexed with the filthy conversation. And it's evident from what they said about him that he talked about it. The God judged them in view of what they knew. They knew this thing was wrong. Nature taught them and Lot was there as a witness against them. There was Abimelech who took Sarah to be his wife. He didn't know that she was Abraham's wife and God God said, you're a dead man, but he said, well, I didn't know. So God dealt with him according to what he knew. He said, well, I, I knew you didn't know. Yeah. That's why I kept you from touching her. See, so he dealt with people according to their level of knowledge and understanding. <coughs> I don't think people today recognize the restricting influence that a lack of knowledge has on a person when they don't know. During those spiritually primitive times in the beginning of Genesis, when heavenly, heavenly revelation was very sparse, some errors in judgment occurred mm -hmm. according to the light we have. Mm -hmm. But these people were handicapped yeah. by what they didn't know. Yeah. That's right. It's a tremendous handicap. Let me tell you. Now, I have a vendetta against preachers and teachers, almost all of them, because they've allowed the people to be ignorant. This is inexcusable. We don't want, I will accept no explanation for this. They have put the people at a tremendous handicap and restriction, because where you don't know, you're automatically handicapped by what you don't know. And the only reason that God winked at these men is because he hadn't revealed. That's right, he hadn't revealed. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Really good. yes. As you've been speaking, I consider what Brother Jason said at, on his sermon at the renewal. He said that the time of ignorance has passed. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Now we have, a, we have an actual example of a, a young person who didn't know the Lord and how God dealt with him. Mm -hmm. It was Samuel. God called to Samuel, but Samuel didn't know it was the Lord. And then the explanation is given, 1 Samuel 3, 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. But after Eli told him who it was, it would have been dead wrong not to answer. It would have been wrong to go back to Leah Eli again after Eli told him, that's the Lord. When he calls, you answer, hear my, speak, thy servant hears. Yeah. So he was judged according to what he, right. what he knew. <laughs> now let's look at some examples of deficient knowledge. There is such a thing as willing ignorance. But that's some of the greatest handicap of all. 
This is the word Hosea delivered. God is speaking. She knew not. She did not know that I gave her corn. She didn't trace her prosperity back to me. She didn't know I gave her corn, multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared. They gave it to Baal as though Baal had given it to them. See? <laughs> didn't know. The Jews' crucifixion of Jesus. Here's a classic example. I want that through ignorance she did it, Peter said. You didn't know. That's why you did that despicable deed, because you didn't know. Now, they should have known, but they didn't know, and I'm showing the handicap of not knowing. So anyone who contributes, who actually contributes to the ignorance of people, they are, in, they are going to be held especially accountable before God. The Jews' effort to establish their own righteousness. They being ignorant of God's righteousness. See what the handicap put them? They being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. They didn't receive righteousness from God because they didn't know righteousness came from God. People still don't know this. And it's a tremendous liability. It may, it may look innocent. People will say, well, there's honest and there's sincere and so forth and so forth. But they're trying to establish their own righteousness because they're ignorant of God's righteousness. Somebody hasn't told them. Or they've been told and they've ignored it. One or the other. The idol worshippers at Athens. They had all these idols they were worshiping. And Paul said to them, As I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar to this, with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly, <coughs> they didn't know. But then Paul made sure that that didn't go beyond, beyond his time there. They came to know. Or Apollos, I'm showing you now that how what you can happen if you don't know something. Apollos was instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Even though at that time the baptism was obsolete. He didn't know. So there's a, a couple there in Corinth, Aquila and Priscilla, and they knew we got to tell him about this. And so they did. See, there's still some people that for all practical purposes practice John's baptism. This is the kind of question Paul would ask him. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? You would not hear anybody ask that question today. People say, have you received the Holy Spirit since you were baptized? Since you believed. They said, we, have, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. Yeah. Evidently, all he knew was evil spirits. So Paul, he corrected that <coughs> situation. There were some in Corinth, <coughs> come from an idolatrous background. They were in the church. <coughs> Evidently, been it for some time. They still didn't know there was one God. <laughs> With all those spiritual gifts. They still didn't know Paul wrote to him. He said, Awake to righteousness and sin not for some. Have not the knowledge of God. Oh, I speak this to your shame. Some people in your church do not know God. Do you think that situation has passed away? It still exists. And it's still a shame. Why? Because it puts the person at a severe handicap. Paul said this about the weaker brethren in Corinth that came from an idolatrous background. They hadn't, their knowledge was not up to speed yet about there being one God. But to us, he says, to us there's one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit there is not in every man this knowledge. You talk about people in the church. 
For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat as, as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. They, they still think if you eat meat offered to an idol, you're worshiping the idol. So if they see you eat meat, you bought it at the meat market, and they knew it was meat offered to idols, they'll think you're worshiping another god too. See what a handicap it was not to know? Or Saul of Tarsus. He described himself as a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly. I, I, I didn't know. So you talk to people like this, and you say, what you know, don't know won't hurt you. you know? They say, wait a minute. That's the thing that will hurt you most, what you don't know. So I'm, I'm painting a picture of what a liability ignorance is and yet, where God doesn't reveal a thing, you're shut up to ignorance. But when God reveals a matter or makes it available to humanity, then they're not shut up to ignorance anymore. Now, the liability of ignorance is seen in the records of early believers. Abraham suggesting Eliezer as his heir. <laughs> the decision of Sarah and Abraham to have Ishmael through Hagar. Both of these were the direct result of not knowing. Now the seriousness of a lack of a, a knowledge is measured by the amount of revelation that's available. That's what it's measured by. When a person receives the love of the truth, it's inevitable it will be attended by a fervent quest to know the truth. See, that, that just accompanies the love of the truth. That's why Solomon said, buy the truth and sell it not. Get it. Wherever you can, get it. Don't pass it by for some of the baubles of this world because if God's made something known and you don't know it, you are limited by that lack of knowledge that you have, just as surely as these other saints were, except God hadn't revealed it to them. <coughs> I feel, some, be, some people say, well, God will, God will see to it, and God will, I understand, God will see to it that the paths of people who love the truth be crossed with people who have the truth to proclaim. But I feel uncomfortable saying that much is not required of those who have not received much if much is available. Jesus said, He that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with a few stripes. I'll be, merc I'll be merciful. But unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall must be required, and to whom men have committed much of him they will ask the more. This being true, this is if this is what Jesus said is true, then perpetual ignorance can under no conditions be justified. An understanding of this would relieve men also from a tendency to judge previous saints that knew so much less than than we know. Think of what we have now. Within, what's in the, it's within the grasp of everybody on earth. We got the testimony of nature. Right? That's a kind of an elementary testimony, but we, we've got it. We've got the testimony of the conscience on which the law of God is written in the conscience. We've got the testimony of the law and the writings of Moses. We got the testimony of the Psalms and the prophets, John the Baptist, and the record of God's Son, and the Apostles' doctrine. That's a lot of. <laughs> it's a lot of witness. Someone says, "Well, now for centuries, this station over here has never heard the gospel. For centuries, now we got a double sin here. That nation over there didn't seek it. Number one." Number two, the people who had it didn't take it. Yeah. it you can't explain, you, rather you can't explain conditions like that like they're conveniently explained in our day. Yeah. Yeah. We've got this, a larger part of the world has never heard the gospel and boo-hoo, boo-hoo and shed the tears. But somebody's going to answer to God for why this condition exists. Yeah. 
The early church, by the time of the middle of the first century, Paul said the gospel had been preached to every creature under heaven. By the middle of the first century. We've been playing games around here for hundreds of years, and we haven't, we haven't approximated reaching all the world. In fact, there's probably parts of our city that haven't even been reached. Yes? I can, I can understand people being ignorant because they're not being told, but I can also understand a level of ignorance that exists by assumption. The people, they're hearing things, but they don't actually know if these things are in the Scripture. They're just assuming that they are. Like these things yeah, you're talking true about, too. That's true Jacob, too. and uh, they're saying like he's a deceiver. He was like a real sinful <laughs> kind of a person. People hear that. They assume it's in the Bible. I mean, they think it is, but they don't actually do like the Bereans did. They don't search the Scriptures and yeah. see if this is actually what's being said. Amen. Mm -hmm. I remember even in the unbelieving world, this could be true too, because you'll hear people say things like, well, I don't believe anything unless there's scientific evidence and I remember someone saying no you rely on men in books and media telling you that the scientific evidence exists you don't actually see it yourself but I see that same kind of concept yeah in the church they they hear people say it's in the Bible they don't actually see it in there yeah and it, that makes their ignorance it doesn't just see a great a great falling away has taken place yeah. brother it's right. yeah, it is frustrating when you can see these things, and you try to explain to someone who is a Christian, but they bought <laughs> into these things like Jacob is this, or one of the uh, great uh, men or women of faith is this, which in Scripture has no um, account of them being what they say they are. Mm -hmm. And you just point to the Scripture, you, you at first... Um, I've come across this, okay, so where does it say that? And they come, it's like, well, he did this. And then I try to explain to them uh, the revelation that was there, and they just don't receive it. I know. It. Then it gets frustrating for you particularly. Yes, it is. Just like, sends out this knowledge that you have, and you want to be accepted, yeah. and it's still not accepted, so it's frustrating on you. He, the reason for it, the reason for it is a great falling away has taken place. Yeah. It's the environment yeah. That has caused this. It's not the individual stubbornness of the person that may very well be there, but it's traced back to this godless environment that is taking knowledge away. The key. Remember, Jesus said to the Pharisees, "You take away the key of knowledge. You, you took it away, and you gave people your view." It's a serious, serious handicap. Amen. Now, our text is in that kind of setting that they didn't have much available to them. And we're going to look at it with that in mind. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. Other versions instead of venison say he ate his game. He ate a taste for his game. He, he, Esau's meat was greatly to be great to his great to his taste. The English word venison literally means hunting or from a hunt. An animal is taken after you pursued it. Generally, men apply it to deer meat, but it's not limited to deer. Venison is like a wild meat that is chased down, hunted, and found. Now, it says in this circumstance, I want to exercise a lot of caution here, not to speak derogatorily of Isaac. Since God doesn't chide Isaac yeah, that's right. for this, I'm not, I'm not either. They're just some things they don't understand, but it's because they're not revealed. It seems to me that here we have a very deliberate overthrow of the notion that God's election is according to prescience. Or that God sees what people are going to do. <laughs> if that's the case, what are you going to do with this incident here? What are you going to do with it? This is the promised seed. Isaac, this is your ordinary man. Uh -huh, yeah. And he loves Esau. Uh -huh. Now, did God not see that? And if he did see it, is he going to shape his purpose around what? Well, I'm going to tell you, no, he's not going to do that. Now, Paul, he affirms, he deals with that. In Romans 9, 11, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Amen. 
So there's a divine choice. Yes, right. How this thing's going to work out is because of a divine choice, not a human choice. Amen. That's what you've got to see. Right. Everything seemed to be against this. Esau is born first. Jacob is born second. It's revealed by the prophet Malachi, however, and confirmed by Paul in Romans 9, that Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. Mm -hmm. right, that contradicted the circumstance. Isaac loved Esau, indicating he was preferred, preferred Esau. Rebekah loved and preferred Jacob. And in our text, will Esau willingly sells his birthright to Jacob. Now, I don't know how you could get prescience out of that, or that God foreknowledge means he saw ahead what was going to happen. I, <laughs> this is very ignorant to take this kind of position. Because you've got God making decisions then based on what he saw men were going to do. So men are really calling the shots. I don't know how else you could interpret that. Paul uses the word call. He said to choose. He called. But of him that calleth. is according to election, not of works, but of him that calleth. Mm -hmm. yeah. As it is written, he said of Abraham, I have made thee a father of many nations. I'm talking about coming on call now. He called. The fact that he, this is the way it's going to be. That's what's going to make this thing happen. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Uh, let me give you some other translations on that. The New Revised Standard said he calls into existence the things that do not exist. The Holman Bible says he calls non-existent things into existence. He calls into existence nations that don't even exist. He calls into being what does not exist. That is, God calls the circumstances. Yeah, that's right. yeah. He's the one, I'm going to establish this, that he's the one that created the circumstances. Yeah, yeah. They weren't created by Jacob or Rebecca. That's right. yeah. They were created by God. Yeah. Now God purposed to create a world and, and he made it happen. God determined to destroy the world with the flood, and he made it happen. God determined men would not build a tower in a city, and so he caused the building to stop. Yep, what I'm saying is, he'll call for something that isn't in existence, and that will shape what, what happens. God determined Abraham would have a son to Sarah, and he made it happen. He called the things that were not as though they were. Now God has determined the elder... Esau will be ruled by the younger, and he is going to make it happen. Amen. The events now before us are being governed by God himself. He's working with circumstances that can in no way add up to what he's doing. Yeah, you take the circumstances here and you put them all together and shake them all and you can't get them to come out. They won't come out. The dice won't fall out like God said it was going to be. He's going to make it happen. Now I'm going to show that this is God's manner of working. He'll take something that a legalist could condemn a person for doing, but then he'll explain, I'm, I'm doing this. Uh -huh. Let's take the case of Samson and a Philistine wife. Samson told his mother and father and mother, and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Well, his mother and father knew this was not according to God's word. God had told him not to intermarry. And so he, the Moses had made it quite clear. So his parents said, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren? Or among thy people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. Samson ignored it and said, get, get, her for, get her for me. All right. Mm -hmm. And now who's going to, is it someone going to sit in judgment on Samson because he did this? 
The Lord revealed, the Holy Spirit gave an editorial remark on that. Yeah, right. But his father and mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. God was making that happen. Amen. God moved Samson to want that woman. Yes, that's right. This was God working. So what appeared to be a stark violation of God's will was actually God working in contradiction of that in an unusual set of circumstances yes. to prove that he gets what he wants. Amen. Yeah. Now, I'll take another one. The case of David numbering Israel. <coughs> this incident where David numbered Israel to make sure he had enough army resulted in 70,000 men dying. Yeah. This incident. Mm -hmm. There's three different views of it given in Scripture. The first is that David himself made the determination. David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go number the children of Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. Well, you remember the... Joab said, oh, you, <laughs> you shouldn't be doing this, David. Oh, you go number. Say, David, you, okay, now we have another view. Same, same, same incident. First Chronicles 21.1. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. So there's, a, there's another side of the same thing. But there's yet another one in 2 Samuel 24.1. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's God doing that. Yeah. See, it's the same thing in our text. Mm -hmm. This is God working. Amen. There's things, listen, brethren. We don't have answers for all Think mysterious things, but there's things that happen that look on the surface like you can't explain them. It doesn't look like it's right, but God, God's working that thing, yes. bringing He's calling His yep. purpose, even if He's got to run rough shod over what people think. He's going to do it. Amen. After David numbered Israel, his heart smote him. That's why God moved David to number him rather than somebody else. Somebody else would have just thought, wouldn't thought anything about it. But he's like he stood for Israel like Moses stood for Israel. So he's gonna he's gonna plead with God and the slaughter will stop with seventy thousand. Had it been for tenderness of David, it'd have kept on going. I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant. I've done very foolishly. See, he didn't know that God <laughs> moved him. And God sent Gad, David's prophet, to him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in the land? How would you like to pick one of those? Uh, which one do you want, David? David couldn't make up, make up his mind. So David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let us fall out of the hand of the Lord. In other words, I'm going to let the Lord make the choice. Yeah, amen. And the Lord chose three days. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a devastation. Yeah. God's anger was kindled against Israel. That's why this whole event arose. Uh -huh. And God caused all these things to happen. Yeah. But there you have a severe judgment leveled against Israel. At the root of the matter, mm -hmm. God's wrath had been kindled. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the people didn't know it. Yeah. Yeah. David didn't know it. I imagine after this they did. Satan was employed. See? Mm -hmm. God calls for Satan. He's employed to provoke David to do this because David wouldn't do it under normal circumstances. Mm -hmm. So God uses Satan to provoke David so that David could do it would do it willingly of his own accord and thus God is able to righteously judge Israel. Now to behold it properly our our thinking yes. You're saying that David did, did this on his own accord. Because, uh, I'm, I'm just getting confused. Um but God doesn't work, you're saying God doesn't work around circumstances. But he works the circumstances. He works the circumstances. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. 
He doesn't work around circumstances, he works the circumstance. See? That's what I'm establishing here. That the circumstances themselves are caused by God. And in the circumstances, he moves people how he wants them to move, to make choices like he wants them to make. In this case with Israel, he was gonna, he was, his anger was provoked against Israel. But he wouldn't just do something without alerting this sensitive man to what was, what was going to happen, knowing that David would plead for the people, and he even and he did, or else the plague would have wiped him out. Same thing as with Moses. So God, the circumstances come from God. God doesn't look at the circumstances, didn't work around them. He causes the circumstances. Yeah, amen. That's what I'm saying. So these three things <laughs> were all true at the same time. Satan provoked yeah. David. That's, that's right. true. David. Numbered Israel. Yeah. It was his. It, in, in his mind, it was his decision. Yeah. But ultimately, the highest That's view right. is God That's was right. over the whole thing, making the whole thing happen. That's right. But see, all those three, of those things can be true at the same time. Oh yeah, yeah. they were all true. Yeah, same they time. were true. It's just different views of the same yeah, thing. Right. So, so huh? Revelation. So unless we had this revelation, it would seem like David by himself did this, and God worked mm -hmm. around his circumstance. No, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, right. yeah God, now if God hadn't have told us this, That's right. yeah. Yeah. we wouldn't have known. Yeah. But it, same with same with Samson. <laughs> but he did. Which is which is what you're establishing that you see, unless God spells it out for yeah. us, we don't know everything yeah. up here. And that's why it's so wrong to talk bad against these that's right. these, yeah. these 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 aged people because we don't know all the circumstances, right. but we do have it spelled out these times. See that to know how God people works. of old, they knew God operated this way. Yeah. 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 So when Job the Sabian swept down and devastated the flocks of Job, he didn't say, those lousy Serbians, let's, say, let's organize an army and go after those Serbians. Yeah. He knew. Yeah. The Lord yes, gave, yeah. the Lord has taken away. Yeah. He didn't know why. That, uh -huh. That's that's what was confusing to him. He didn't know why, yeah. but he knew, did yeah. know who. Yeah. Amen. I'll be a lying uh, spirit <laughs> That's about right. the prophet. You'll, you'll yeah. convince him. You go. That's right. Yeah, this changes the fact that if you got a you got a grumpy old boss, you yeah. know. Yeah. And you got to be able to, to apply something like this. Uh, yeah. Maybe you've been slopping around on a job. Or maybe you haven't. Well, I'm not making a judgment here, but I'm just saying you've got to bring God into your thinking. Yes, amen. You've got incidents like this to teach you to do that. Maybe you, you, you've you been given something to do and it's too hard for you to do. Well, maybe God's tired of you dragging your feet. Amen. This is how you got to think. I'm telling you the truth. You got to think God must expect more of me than I've been able to do comfortably. That's true. I've kind of been sloughing along here, doing things that were convenient. Huh? Mm -hmm. You've got to trace things back to God. Mm -hmm. He's the one that's working in the earth. Amen. <coughs> Isaiah gives this exhortation. Remember the former things of That's old. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I am God, there's none else. I am God, there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall yeah. stand, mm -hmm. I will do all my pleasure. See, yeah. when he said, the elder is going to serve the younger, mm -hmm. what we're reading in Genesis now is how God made that come to pass. Right. Yeah. It isn't through a bunch of human blunders. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Brother Jim, it's like uh, you can see the reaction of Job and then the reaction of people today when things happen... You hear more and more people saying, why did God let this happen? Instead of understanding that God is is doing it for a reason, you may not yeah. know why, or later on you may see it, but just know that God's working it out. Yeah. He's, Sometimes God spells out things. Yeah. God made a fish. The fish swam along by the boat waiting for Jonah. Then, yeah. then God sent a storm. Uh -huh. yeah. Then God made a gourd grow up. Then God made a worm that killed a gourd. That's he, he, behind the scenes. Nobody else would have concluded that's what was happening. But that was God working that way so he could show Jonah, see I have much people in that city 
120,000 don't know their right hand from their left. That was 120,000 babies. He wasn't saying they were adults that didn't know their right hand from their left. Uh -huh. And beside that, a lot of cattle. Mm -hmm. Yes, Paul. This is why the Apostle Paul said to give thanks in all circumstances. That's right. Amen. Mm -hmm. You got it. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> By the Lord's mercies, we're not consumed. Yeah, that's right. The idea that a God would only respond to circumstances in the earth is a misnomer in itself. <laughs> Because it wouldn't be a God. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right. Amen. It's, it's, uh, I've never thought about how common it is until you explain these things and how common it is for people to think of God only in the terms of responding to what men do uh -huh. and not making things That's right. happen. But you That's have right. all kinds of tes testimony of this in Scripture of God mm -hmm. making things happen. Uh -huh. yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Prophet Isaiah gives a testimony that he sets them throned above the circle of the earth. Well, Solomon tells about how things just go <laughs> round and round and round yeah. and round the same things. That's how it looks it, under yeah, the sun, it's right. but it's not the way it is it, because he's above the circle. Amen, of the earth. amen. He's upholding all things by the word of his power. Yeah, yeah. Amen. See, that kind of that uh, it erodes all kinds of things like trust, trusting God. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. If God responds to what men do, then it like it makes trusting God takes it out yeah. of the picture, makes it ear uh, makes it not function, and the sovereignty of God. It it is true that God does respond to men, but I would say He doesn't only. Well, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. The, God's primary motive. Yeah, that's right. Of working is His. Like you mentioned, earlier, He purposed it according to the counsel of His own will. Mm -hmm. Now this is a great comfort if you re if you trust God, yeah, if you right. believe in God, mm -hmm. God can alter circumstances. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> yes. Yes, well, Jonathan. Yeah, God. You know, doing shaping what He does around circumstances. To me, a lot of that kind of thinking has come from such a heavy emphasis on man's will, mm -hmm. yeah. because I think yeah. it's led men to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. You do, and then God will do. You That's see what right. I mean? I mean, when, when yeah. you leave out the other part where God orchestrates events and you just put yeah. it, it's all up to you. That's how men will start to think about how God works. One of the tenets of the modern charismatic movement is that God can do nothing until man asks him to. It's a doctrinal tenet of the charismatic movement, the whole kit and caboodle of it. And that God won't give to you until you give to him. There's a whole body of teaching about this. Now that's that to Jacob loved Esau. But this is God working out his purpose. He's got to work it out in spite of what looks like a situation that is going to work to the contrary. But, re yes. Sorry, what, what you just said that men say that God will not do anything until men ask him to, that makes judgment obsolete. Because no, right. no man Amen. wants judgment upon himself. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's right. But Rebecca yeah. loved Jacob. Yeah. Right. Now the Believer's Study Bible, which has a lot of nice things, says of this verse, the tendency of Isaac to favor Esau and the Preferential feelings of Rebecca for Jacob laid the foundation for much sorrow. Parental partiality is a tragedy in any home, as is parent-child alignment against a spouse. Okay. Now, any uh, counselor about home situations would agree with that. But they forget that sometimes a man's foes are those of his own house. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Huh? And some might say, you should not have foes in your own house. Yeah. Well, if you take Christ out of the picture, yes, but... Yes? Jesus himself addressed that matter. He said, you think I've come to bring peace, but a sword. Mm -hmm. He said, mother, yeah. Yeah, father against son and mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. That's right. So there, yeah. When the first came into the picture, divisions were made. I'm going to give, I hope I'm not getting ahead of you, but Rebecca had already been told that God was going to favor the young Oh, yes. Man. That's why she's, yes. yes. That's, so she's that's why she thought this way. A godly mm -hmm. yes. Now, see, this quote that I gave you here 
is an example of the injection of human opinion into the text of Scripture. Rather than perceiving the text as a revelation of how God is calling things, mm -hmm. but of him that calleth, mm -hmm. not of works, but of him that calleth, mm -hmm. he's not going to do it because Jacob mm -hmm. was loved by Isaac. Mm -hmm. okay? You might think that's the way it work. Jacob is the head of the wife. The wife ought to be a subjection to the husband. Her desires to her husband. So I'm going to work it out by Jacob's going to Isaac's going to prefer Jacob. But instead, mm -hmm. Isaac prefers Esau. <laughs> this is deliberate. God's yeah. setting this up. Yeah, right. He's showing you if you can ever find out what God's doing and get on God's side, what he does, what he's present, he will do, he will do. Amen. He will even do it to you. Yes. Even if all the circumstances are shouting to the contrary. See, oh, it's a good news, I'll tell you. I propose that those to whom God has spoken directly and those who have believed what is said have shaped their thinking around what God said. Now if God said, it shall go well with the righteous, which he has said. All right, I choose to believe that. I'm going to concentrate on righteousness and I'm going to accept whatever comes my way is good. Amen. If Samuel comes to me, and he says, uh, God's upset with you, Eli. And uh, your sons are going to die. And the Ark of the Covenant is going to be taken. And I will say, good is the word of the Lord. Yeah. That's, that's a good word, Samuel. Yeah. I'll receive that. Mm -hmm. hmm? I'll receive that, Samuel. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, I know by experience, you'll not, you don't know many people like this. Our, our age has not produced many people that think like this. But this is the way godly people have thought through the ages. He said, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. When Nathan told David the baby's going to die, he said, well, I'm going to wash my face now. I, he can't come to me, but I can go to him. See? That was the end of the matter. Yeah. That was the end of the weeping. Was it once he saw God? Amen. God was in this. Here come again, this is contrary to nature. Rebecca will not defer to the preference of her husband, which it was a normal, that's the normal rule. Her desire shall be to her husband. It was a normal how God created the husband and wife, and as a result of sin that she would defer. But here she doesn't defer because God's working this out. He's going to work it out so you will not be able to trace it back to humanity in any way. You're going to, the only way you're going to be able to account for the way this thing's going to end up is, is God did it. Yes. Like God mixes up the circumstances, so there's no pattern in there That's to right. identify yourself. You got to be able to see the hand of God working in this. Amen. I have a tendency to always look for that pattern. You, know, you, you take Saul of Tarsus now after he's in, he could look back and say, "Well, oh, that was God made had me raised up by Gamaliel. That was God in there doing that." Yeah, when I was persecuting the church, oh, that was God, because I got to see what real disciples, how they laid down their lives. I, he could see he could see God's hand in all, all through his past, even though he lived with deep regret that he did what he did. The hand of God was still in all of that. <laughs> in David's case there, it, it, it seems rather odd to his servants that David would weep yeah. so long and to lament and not eat <laughs> But after the child died, he didn't weep. Yeah. See, it didn't make sense in, in the natural yeah. realm. But David could see further than the natural. And he saw this is in God's hand now. You got the, uh, the child not going to come back to me. But see, that flesh and blood didn't produce that in David. No. Yeah. Amen. This is all good. This is, this is good stuff. <laughs> I do give you some quotes of what various men have said about this text to show that there are a variety of opinions, but they're, most of the men sided with the right. Mm -hmm. 
Now think what God had to overcome just to the to this point in our text. Think what God had to overcome to get his purpose done. The sin of Adam and Eve, that, that looked like that looked like that blasted the whole thing. The murder of Cain, who was the seed. Seth took his place. The moral decline of humanity. Look, it looked looked like the thing that we're gonna work out at all. Human independence seed of the plain of Shinar. This is all this was all of humanity. This wasn't just like a little clan of people. The barrenness of Sarah. And I list some other things. But God is carrying out his purpose. And like the stone as it rolls over all the other kingdoms, the stone is rolling over all these circumstances and grinding them all to powder so the will of the Lord's done, even though it looks like it's not going to be done. <clears throat> now there are certain matters that God said were going to happen that couldn't have been left to chance. The birth and maturity of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, that God talked a lot about them. This couldn't have been left to chance, to human decision, or the development of a Jewish nation that would, in, among whom the son, to whom the son would be given, by whom he'd be raised. Or how about the culture of the land of Canaan? There's, there's a, there's a, God's purpose is going to depend on that land being there. Or the genealogy leading to Joseph and Mary. Well, the coming of Christ at an appointed time, how could this be based on prescience? Seeing ahead what was going to... How could something like that be, be based out of human decisions? Or the resurrection of Christ on the third day. Or the day of Pentecost when it's fully come, and so forth. It says, God said, I believe Gene read this already. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Yeah, now the scene changes swiftly. Jacob sod, sod means boiled, sod pottage, pottage is soup or stew, something you boil. And Esau came from the field and he was faint. <laughs> well, there's a the circumstance. Jacob's Boiling a pot of stew, Esau comes in from the field, and he's faint and weary. And you say, well, what kind of significant thing could happen from those circumstances? Those, those certainly, those don't seem too significant. It's no wonder Jesus said, don't judge according to appearance. It may just look like so and so is cooking a pot of stew. Yeah. That's right. It may look like you just come, you're just tired after a day's work. Mm -hmm. uh, don't be too hasty to judge. A birthright's going to legitimately pass from one person to another person out of this set of circumstances. Right. Yeah. So you'd think normally that'd be a horn blowing and flag waving in a seminar and a bunch of other stuff to. Herald the passing of an inheritance from one person birth from one person to another, but this this is the circumstance under which it happened. A prophecy is going to be fulfilled. Two differing manner of people are going to be confirmed. Going to be confirmed. Here's two people. They don't think the same way. And an attitude toward an inheritance is going to be made known. It probably wasn't known up to this point. Well, what are what are circumstances? Because we brought those up. <coughs> circumstances are occasions when human preferences are made known. That's that's what a circumstance is. <laughs> there are times when the nature of a person is revealed. When they come to a crossroads, there's circumstances, and you can make a right choice or wrong choice. All sin. And all righteousness finds its expression in the framework of circumstance. All of them. Circumstance is the environment in which things are done. Yeah. Adam and Eve made an epochal decision while Eve was holding a conversation with the devil. 
Cain killed Abel while he was talking with him in the field. Circumstance. <coughs> Sitting at the gate of Sodom, Lot chose to be vexed with the filthy conversation. That circumstance, that's how it affected him. Faced with a hard circumstance, Moses chose the sufferings of Christ rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. See, all of that men would be more thoughtful in circumstance. See, when you live in a society where entertainment is, is kind of been exalted, it dulls people to circumstance. Their, their abilities to judge and evaluate and decide and perceive are all reduced because they live in a make-believe world all the time. Now Esau, he's faint, weak. Feed me, I pray thee, with that same pottage, for I am faint. Some versions say that red stuff. He didn't even call it, he didn't care what it was. He didn't really care what it was. That stuff you're cooking there. He didn't even say, give me a bowl to eat. He said, you feed me. You feed me. Now, was he actually perishing? I, I have my doubts. I know that Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and the devil came to him, tempted him to eat something. I don't think Esau had been fasting 40 days and 40 nights. I think he misassessed. He misassessed his own case because his God was his belly. See? The Bible warns us about people like this. All seek their own, not the things which be of Christ. Yea, they are greedy dogs, Isaiah said, which can never have enough. They are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. Come, ye say, they will fetch wine. We shall fill ourselves a strong drink, and tomorrow shall be as this day, and much more abundant. We just feed ourselves. They serve their belly. That's what Paul said about them in Romans 16, 18. I've already gave you a comparison of Esau with Jesus. Esau sees the stew. He's willing to take it at any cost. Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and he'll not do anything that violates the will of God. He could turn a stone into bread. He could have created a loaf of bread. That he's not going to do it. See, notice the different response between them. Then you've got the incident of Elisha's servant. I'm showing you the power of circumstance now. The circumstance may look impossible, but that doesn't mean it is. The king of Syria was troubled because every time he made a strategic move, the Israel, the king, the king of Israel knew about it. They knew ahead of time what it was going to happen. He said, what's going on? He said, well, the prophet Elisha knows everything you're doing. Ahead of time. So this king sent out some horses and chariots and great hosts, and they came by night and compassed the city of Dothan about. Elisha's servant got up early and went out. Behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots, and his master and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? What <laughs> look what are we gonna do? Looks hopeless. It was a circumstance. This was a circumstance. But the, but the prophet, the, the prophet Gehazi just saw part of the circumstance. He didn't see all of it. So Elisha said, fear not, fear not. He saw the whole picture. They that be with them, more than, are they that be with us than are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, Lord, I pray thee open his eyes that he may see. Lord opened his eyes to the young man. He saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Sometimes, sometimes I'm tempted to pray for people, and I hope sometimes they pray this way for me. Lord, open their eyes so they can see what's going on. They think all these things are against them. They think things aren't going well. They don't see how anything good can come from. Lord, open up their eyes. See, you haven't abdicated the throne. Yes, amen. You're still working out your purpose. Those were, that was a circumstance. But if the circumstance isn't seen right, well, the early church, it would fall into a circumstance. 
They were persecuted, the apostles were beaten, they were thrown in prison, they were told not to speak anymore. That's a circumstance. Now what are we going to do? I could just see man from the first church to the Frigidaire rise and say, well, it looks like the Lord's leading us to leave Jerusalem and go to some other part of the country. That's not how these people thought. They had a pick, they had a grasp of who God is. So they prayed. They said, Lord, <laughs> all we're asking is just look at what they're doing. Just look at what they're doing. <laughs> and what we're asking for is a boldness to preach the word. And that was their response to the circumstance. And so God, their place was shaken and great boldness came upon them and great power. The apostles gave witness to the resurrection. That's how they responded to circumstances. Either I'm, I'm telling you that circumstances like this have arisen in our time that have not been responded to in that manner. Yes, right. So many uh, deluded soul has fallen into hard times because they were swayed by appearance and they responded inappropriately to circumstance. <coughs> Give me that red stew. Give me that red stew. Therefore was his name called Edom. Well, oh, how's that? How's that for an insignificant thing? I'd like some of that red stew. Heaven said, we're going to call him Edom, which means red. We're going to call him Edom from now on. Sort of a, sort of a tombstone to the choice he made. He chose red stew yes. uh -huh. to the birthright. So now we're going to call him Edom. Red. Well, this point is made of this in Scripture. Genesis 36, 1 says, These are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or Genesis 36, 8, Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. Uh -huh. yeah. These are the sons of Esau, who is Edom. <laughs> And the land they dwelled in was called Edom. And that's traced back to this yeah. Yeah. insignificant event. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Esau is the father of the Edomites. Uh -huh. yeah. And all the, and remember it said the elders shall serve the younger. Remember that? Yeah. Now here's David who was a descendant of Jacob. Okay. Yes about that, 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 that time and that he asked for that and, and he said that his name is going to Edom, didn't really, I, I think from, probably from Esau's perspective, asking for that wasn't, it seemed insignificant, but he was called Edom for the rest of his life, and so it was actually very, very significant. That's right. That's exactly the point. That's how God viewed it, see? Yeah. You're right. And again, when the Israelites were wandering about um, in Canaan, when they passed by Edom, God even told them, I've given this land to the Edomites. Yeah, don't touch Your it. Your brother, don't touch it. That's right. So just go around it. Yeah. So the Lord's given them not only a name, which is tombstone, but just given a particular land. That's right. Just for them. Kind of like a, tro kind of like a sign, signpost. Yeah. Yeah, the name also should have been a reminder to them. That's about right. God's choice. Mm -hmm. That when they, they hated Israel, just their very name showed that the birthright it it wasn't theirs. It was it was a testimony. Amen. And not only to them, but to the to the other tribes around there that were descendants of Abraham. There's, there, it's a witness. Mm -hmm. for what people call Palestinians today. Mm -hmm. that, yes, amen. That, that Israel was the chosen of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right. I remember he said the elder will serve the younger. Uh -huh. yeah. well, now David was the offspring of Jacob. This statement is found in First Chronicles 28, 13. And he put garrisons in Edom and all the Edomites became David's servants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, actually, in their lifetime, Esau never did, uh, Jacob never ruled over Esau person to person. 
but they're descendants. They, as they, they, he was speaking about them as a progenitor or the father of a race. And the race of Esau served Jacob's race. <laughs> when we come to the name of... Now, other names were changed because of an encounter with, with God. Abram was changed to Abram, Sarai to Sarah, Jacob to Israel, Simon to Peter. Because of an encounter with God... But his name was changed because of an encounter with a pot of stew. Yeah. <laughs> That's all it took to bring out what was really in Jacob, just a pot of right. stew. Yeah, right. Just a pot of stew. Yeah. Now listen, I know people that have fallen just for a moment of pleasure. That's right. yeah. They faced a circumstance, it was just, just maybe a minute long, mm -hmm. but they bartered their soul off. That circumstance proved what they really, really were. So Jacob responds to the request. He says, sell me your birthright today, right away. Let's, let's do this right away. Sell me your birthright. Now, see, there have been other occasions where birthrights went to someone who, by nature, wasn't authorized to have it. For instance, um, Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler. And Reuben actually was the firstborn. Firstborn rights were conferred upon Manasseh instead of Ephraim, as Joseph's son. Remember, that's when Isaac crossed his, uh, Jacob crossed his hands. Solomon was chosen over Adonijah, who was the firstborn. Son of Hosa. Simri was given the right to firstborn even though he was not the firstborn. This is God working his purpose out. See that there's the norm, there's the normal or the standard way, but if God's, if that standard runs counter to God's purpose, he just overrides the, you can't override the standard. Now you, you, you can't do that. But God can. Ordinarily, Repentance and so forth are required to be accepted by Christ. But then God overruled that standard by, with the thief on the cross. <laughs> I imagine he did repent. But the point is that it was an unusual reaction. And unusual reactions are never the standard. Well, Esau, he, he has a quick reply to this. He says, I'm at the point to die. Which I'm, I'm not sure that was a proper assessment. What profit shall this birthright do to me? This is a worthless piece of paper, you might say. <laughs> I'm hungry. I can't eat a birthright. One man said, this was uttered in the spirit of Epicurean levity. <laughs> Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. That's pretty good, <laughs> pretty good assessment. His God was his belly, see? Yeah. His belly dictated what he did. Yeah. His appetite, his physical appetite dictated what he did. Most, that's not uncommon in our day. Yeah. David once said, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Not with his speech in his heart. That is, he thought as though there was no God. Here it is in Esau. He's thinking like there's no God. Yeah, that's right. uh -huh. The wicked through part of his countenance will not seek after God. God's not in all of his thoughts. We also learn from this that faith cannot be passed from one person to another. Yeah, that's right. God doesn't have any grandchildren. Your faith may be strong like Abraham's. Or maybe strong like Isaac, but he couldn't pass it along to. You can't. See, some people are confused by this. That's, some people say, raise up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Then they read over all the texts where people were old and did depart from it, like Solomon. Okay, what does that mean? Well, that's your business to find out what it means. It doesn't mean what people say. It means that's the normal, yeah. uh -huh. that's the normal way things work out. 
But it's not the way it works out all the time because God's first son went astray. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right? Mm -hmm. And if what people tell you about raising your children guarantees that they'll be godly, if, they, if, that's, if that's a true teaching, then they, they, we've got to explain what happened to Adam and Eve. Those are God's. Yeah. It was God's children. Esau's give it to me now desperateness. We see unreasonableness also. That's right. Mm -hmm. because That's right. He just traded off his birthright because he said, I am at the point of death. And if he really was, then the soup would help him get away from the point of death. And once he was away from the point of death, then any normal person would want the birthright back. Mm. So in his desperation, he said, Give it to me now, for I'm about to die. Yeah. But he didn't die, because he got the suit. Yeah, well, the see, suit. He, he, didn't, he didn't value the birthright. That's why he said that. He never did value the birthright. That's why he said that. This circumstance brought out what he really was. He really despised his birthright. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I know in this account... It's very common to ascribe bad motives to Jacob, but see, God said that Esau was a profane person, a fornicator, a position where you have to charge bad motive. Those are the people you want to charge the bad motive to. That's true. Amen. <laughs> now think of how Abraham thought under very difficult circumstances. God said, through your seed, I'm going to bless all families of the earth. And now look, Abraham, look up at the stars. I'm going to make your offspring like this, like the stars. So now how does Abraham respond to that? That's a circumstance now. That's a circumstance. I don't have any children. I don't have any indication I ever can have any children. And here's God promising me not just one son, but my offspring like the stars of the sky. So the scripture says, well, given this sort of circumstance, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Now that's how faith reasons, where God is the center of thinking. <coughs> so it's good for us to... Uh, Evaluate how we look at circumstances. What, what do we conclude when we see circumstances? If we have faith, we'll think differently. Amen. Jacob said, now swear to me. Like, I don't trust you. I don't trust you, so you're, he must have... He must have shown he was profane already, yeah. evidence that. Right? You swear to me now. So he did. He swore to him. So he sold him his birthright. He sold his birthright to Jacob. What did Jacob do? Well, he he didn't just give him some of the red stew. He gave him bread and something to drink too. He gave him a full gave him a full meal. So he gave him a good bargain. Jacob gave Esau bread and a bottle of lentils. He did eat and drank. Rose up and went his way. So he wasn't too weak. <laughs> that was in two week. That's the way of the flesh. It places such a high priority on the here and now that it'll do anything for the best to be here and now. Yeah, not willing to wait, not willing to hope, not willing to live by faith. Yeah. Wants it now. But this sensitivity is not found in Esau, not at all. Remember Jesus said, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, Esau gave a, exchanged it for a bowl of stew. Adam and Eve exchanged it for a piece of fruit. Achan exchanged it for a Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold. Ananias and Sapphira exchanged it for leading people to believe they were more generous than they really were. See, by way of comparison, you look at Moses, 
He chose yeah. under certain circumstances, see. Right. He chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Paul, he said, yeah, I'm going to choose. He said, I see the circumstances. I'm going to, everything that was gained to me, I'm throwing it away. My single quest is going to be to know Christ. Because I know if I have Christ, I got everything. Amen. That's how he reasoned. <coughs> <coughs> so Jacob gave it. Now comes a divine assessment. <laughs> Thus Esau despised his birthright. All right, that's the divine assessment now of the situation. He said, he didn't say, and so Jacob took advantage of Esau. Is that what he says? So Esau acted very foolishly, but after all, he was very hungry. He despised his birthright. The word despise, what does that, what does that mean? In the Hebrew tongue, it means to hold in contempt or disdain. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not worth fighting for, to keep. In the Greek language, it means to condemn, despise, disdain, think little or nothing of. In English, it means to look down on with contempt or aversion. To regard as negligible, worthless, or distasteful. So here someone says, I'm not going to be your friend now. Unless you quit going to church so much. Yeah. Well, what's the person going to do? Assuming his attitude is proper. God foresaw that Esau would despise his birthright, and therefore he orchestrated the circumstance to bring that out. Yes, amen. That's what it boils down yeah. to. Right. Say, did God make Esau? This Esau was profane. Yes. All he needed was the right circumstances, and he couldn't bluff his way through it anymore. When everything was going well, he could act like he put a big value on the inheritance. Maybe that's why very difficult circumstances happen to people that cause them to depart from the faith. Maybe that's why. It's because their heart was flawed all along, but we didn't see it. They didn't see it, but the circumstances brought it out. Yes. I was thinking, when it says here, um, it says Esau despised his birthright. It gives no people. It gives um, people no room to say something wrong about Jacob in these circumstances. Here. Say that again, honey. What it says here about um, Esau despising his birthright gives people no room to say something wrong about Jacob. That's right. Amen. If we're going to say something wrong, we say about Esau. <laughs> Esau despised his birthright. You look at the, uh, how, how observant Jacob was yeah. in, 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 in waiting for an opportunity. So, mm -hmm. I mean, his preference was the opposite. He was looking for an opportunity to get the birthright. I mean, this, the, he had to be thinking about the birthright for, this, oh, yeah. for his circumstance to turn out this way. Esau was thinking more about food, but, but you're right. This it, God manufactured the circumstance to fit the person. That's exactly now, it, one, Amen. it brought out his faith and, and, <laughs> and his desire for the birthright, while the other one, it proved that his he despised. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the truth of the matter was, the birthright was superior, yes. and food for the belly was inferior. Yes. But now it's how people regard it being made known. So, Esau despised the birthright yes. and preferred the pot of stew. Well, not even the whole pot, just a, just a portion of it. So as I see it, God is working all things according to the counsel of his will, orchestrating the circumstance. Why? So in the end, no one would be able to say God did this because he did that. Rather, you say he did that because God determined this. It's a completely different way of reasoning. This is how God carried out his counsel. This is how he did it. Yeah. Amen. He first of all set up the circumstances so that from the birth mm -hmm. yeah. it didn't look like this was right. Mm -hmm. yeah. From the birth. He also from this womb pointed out that these were two different kind of people. They couldn't have equal rights because they were different kinds of people. 
And so he he passed the judgment. The elder is going to serve the younger. It doesn't make any difference to the order of birth. It doesn't make any difference which parent loves him. It doesn't make any difference. I'm going to set up the circumstances so that it will just work out this way and the godly be made known and the ungodly will too. Yes. He had, That's right. It showed that he was going to, first chance to get, he's going to turn loose of his birthright. Yeah. That's right. It's the same thing with Lot, remember? That's right. When, when the angels came, they brought all this to a head. Now, they were ready to haul Lot out of there. They were tired of him. Yeah. Anyway, and so that which just brought all that to a head. That's right. Yeah. I think I'm going to have to stop there, brethren. I did include in this a little uh, summation of Romans 9, 10 to 13 where Paul deals with this event. But I did want you to see how that it's God that works all in all. Of course that statement is made in scripture but this, this is an exact classic example of it working out that way. And if you want to apply it to today, he orchestrated it so people that are not close to God will talk like people that aren't close to God. Uh -huh. yes. And they'll criticize the wrong person. Yes. And they'll take the wrong side. Mm -hmm. That's why this text is in Scripture, to cause that to happen. Yes, that's right. But when God said he set his love on Jacob, I speak only for myself, mind you, but I'm not going to be siding against Jacob in any way. Amen. That's right. Yeah. And of course, the ultimate person that God values is Christ. Uh -huh. And whoever honors the Son honors the Father. Amen. Yeah. Right. Anyone else have something you'd like to say tonight? Yes, Brother Ricky. Brother, Publicly, thank you. I, and I know all my brethren are with me on this. You know, it said in the scripture that God showed his ways to Moses. To yeah, his amen. To Israel. Yeah. And that's what you've done for us over the years. Uh -huh. So you've given us an ability to interpret mm -hmm. and see God's work. As you talked about, you know, these texts of scripture where God doesn't say, God did this, God moved this, God did, and yet we can see God in this because you've shown us about God. It's kind of like when John, you remember after Jesus died and ascended, the, the, his disciples went out to fish. Yeah. And it, you, it must have been early in the morning where it wasn't quite light and able to see really well, but Jesus was way off on the shoreline there. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. And you remember, he yeah, called John. out to him mm -hmm. yeah. to cast their nets on the other side. Well, I, John, see, he knew the Lord. He was already doing the work yeah, from, when, that's he, right. from yeah. when he got his commission as a disciple. Yeah. The same thing happened then. It's the Lord. Yeah, it's that, the Lord. That's, that's the Lord. right. That's what you've done for us in yeah. these kind of things. Well, thank you. Amen. When we, this whole free will thing has really restricted people's ability to, yeah. to recognize God's work in yeah. things. So yeah. you look at a text like this, and it's entirely interpreted in the flesh. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you've given us the tools to recognize, even though it doesn't always say God did, God did, we can actually look at our circumstances yeah. and now look at it and say, mm -hmm. it's the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some, and I've learned this by experience, like, like you have learned it. Don't jump to quick conclusions about your circumstances, whether they're home or job or whatever. Don't, don't jump to premature conclusions. Think with God at the center of your thinking. And if it's difficult to do, ask God for grace to help you do it. To help me think with God as the center of my thinking. Yes. Throughout this, it, it has... Um been increasingly clear whenever in the in the garden it uh, or before God created man he said let us make man in our image and there's a reason for an image it's to show forth the, uh, the likeness of, of the, the thing that is being uh, is the is the thing that the image is of okay? So as we go through all of this thing, the whole world, from Adam to the last person that draws breath, mankind, the purpose of mankind is for God to show himself in him. Good. Amen. And so all of these events, now see, 
because we live in a span of time and there's much that we have to learn it's the propensity of people to <coughs> interpret things in terms of their own existence mm -hmm. instead of setting themselves in the context of God in eternity mm -hmm. and what can be seen of God Amen. and what he's doing with the people collectively, with the world collectively, with each of us as individuals. It's still all about God Amen. and about him making himself mm -hmm. known. Mm -hmm. So uh, whenever we read these these are just like high points in humanity where God is revealing more of himself or a specific aspect of himself. Mm -hmm. And then as the rest of us reason on these things and conform to it, mm -hmm. then it's seen. And again, the primary example is Christ. Mm -hmm. What what did Jesus show? He was a man in whom we saw the Father. Yeah, amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes, Sister Emma? Um, Babylon teaches people today that um, Abel was like, um, sorry, he, uh, Jacob, I'm sorry. Esau. Jacob was plotting the whole thing, and he was, had a plan and stuff, but it, it really, and they're like blaming Esau for this and saying that God punished him and stuff, but really, it says in the Bible that Esau despised his birthright and so Jacob wanted it and so he traded it and he didn't steal it or anything he did the right thing <laughs> that's <And> right <laughs> amen. <laughs> amen that's good sister Emma yes well, I appreciate your labors in showing mm -hmm. how the Lord is the one working He's the one directing and he's yeah. the one orchestrating uh -huh. events and things that, that come about. And whenever whenever God is seen in all of the circumstances that you might encounter, then it makes those circumstances doable. Mm -hmm. you, can, mm -hmm. you can say to the king, whether the Lord delivers us or not, we mm -hmm. will not bow. Mm -hmm. They knew that God was yes, in control. Amen, amen. Or Daniel, you can deliver me to the lion's den, but I'm not going to cease from praying. Amen. And so when you... When you when you see that the Lord is the one who's at the center, and He uh -huh. is the one that is is moving these things about, then you can do these things um, with with um, grace and um, do them well. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that you had said was that the Lord, um, if He set a standard, then He's the one that can override that standard. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking of the potter and the clay. He's the potter. That's right. And he sees that That's there's right. something that he would rather do with this clay, then he's the one that can reshape that and do what he wants with it. He's the author and the finisher. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yes, Brother Mike. God doesn't hold against someone, uh, hold it against someone for being ignorant of something that he has not revealed. Mm -hmm. That God would be that would be unrighteous of God to to punish someone for being ignorant about something He did not reveal, such as the the ancient patriarchs and mm -hmm. some of the things that that happened to them. But then, as as you brought out, it's a very different story when God has given revelation and men are ignorant of it. Mm -hmm. God has a acts differently towards people like in that situation. I was thinking there there are things that we don't know, mm -hmm. and and God, uh, because He's gracious, has made provision. I thought of the the ministry of the Holy Spirit, but we know not how we how to pray yeah, as we right. ought. We know not what we should pray for yeah. as we ought. Uh -huh. Well, God God doesn't punish us for that. Yeah. Yeah. He's it's good. This is something that's not been revealed. He's, he actually provides a ministry, the Holy Spirit ministers for the saints yeah. in this behalf because it, it's, it's concerning things that God has not revealed. Amen. And uh, concerning Jacob and Esau, I've thought for a long time now that people uh, sympathize most with people who are most like themselves. Yeah. That's good. I see it a lot. People who sympathize with Esau just... Okay, Esau, well, right? An Edomite indeed. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right, we'll have a word of prayer. 
Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the extent to which You revealed Yourself and showed how You work among men. We pray, for Father, for grace to properly assess our circumstances and to bring You into the center of our thinking, all the while remembering that You are good and You are righteous. For this we give Thee thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.